June 1904. Just so surely as midwinter comes, it brings in its train mishap, if not disaster, upon the Atlantic. The season never passes without a big liner being overdue and causing anxiety, almost panic, while freighters vanish from the sea and leave never a trace of the destruction that overtook them. Then the mariner nerves himself for conflict against blizzard and berg, and in all the western ocean ports, navigators scan the weather record to track the movements of the mighty ice masses that encumber the waters beyond the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Difficulty and danger beset the voyager on every side, and they who go down to the sea in ships become, all too often, the sport of misfortune and the actors in dramas which thrill the world with their weird and sometimes ghastly scenes. But a special risk attends the navigation of the North Atlantic, that of encounters with icebergs. No other great trade route suffers from this peril, the most deadly the mariner has to reckon with. As the passengers on some cracked flyer throng her rail on a glorious day to view and snapshot the dazzling spectacle of one of these stately wanderers drifting slowly south in lonely grandeur, a grim smile will probably flicker on the captain's countenance as he hears the exclamations of delight and recalls the fact that, only the previous night in a dense fog, as the passengers lay sleeping, the ship and all on board barely escaped colliding with one of those floating crystal islands. Human science and ingenuity have never devised any contrivance to detect these silent foes. The mightiest of fabrics constructed by human hands are frail as eggshells against them, and they have wrought more ruin than any other obstruction that threatens the traffic of the ocean. These bergs are the terror of every shipmaster crossing the North Atlantic. They are fragments from the stupendous Greenland glaciers, forced out of the Arctic seas by thousands every summer and carried south by the currents, passing Newfoundland during the winter and being dissolved by the warmer embraces of the Gulf Stream as they enter it the next spring. The largest of them ground on the Newfoundland coast and on the Grand Banks as a bird carries seven-eighths of its bulk below water and they often stick fast for weeks. Hence, in this area, they linger the whole year round and are a never absent source of danger. Nature offers few more impressive sights than these beautiful ivory sea castles, endowed with every graceful and fantastic outline and often 500 feet high and a half a mile long. They excite the admiration of all beholders when viewed from a position of safety but no object is more dread by the sailor when, in the inky blackness of a midnight storm, the blinding fury of a snow squall, or the ghastly shroud of sodden fog, his ship is crossing the ice belt on the banks. For the bergs are thickest there in the path of the steamers, and warning in their approach and deadly in their embrace, and woe to the ship, however staunch, that tests herself against the towering crystal cliffs. So many and serious were the accidents from this cause that, in 1897, the chief New York lines abandoned the direct route across the banks for a safer sea road farther south. This lessened but did not end the risk. In September 1899, the city of Rome from Glasgow for New York, with 1,600 humans aboard, 500 being saloon passengers, struck a berg at midday in the steamer track while running half speed through a fog. With a double watch set and the passengers at lunch, the crash came. Men and mules were shot into a heap below the stairway whence a frightened crowd rushed for the deck. Fortunately, discipline was good. The rush was stemmed and the panic soon eased. The berg, a small flat one known as a growler, was cut in two by the ship, whose bow was stove below water. Her bulkheads kept tight, however, and she reached port safely. The most remarkable case on record of an iceberg collision is that of the Guion liner, Arizona, in 1879. She was then the Greyhound of the Atlantic and the largest ship afloat, 5,750 tons, except the Great Eastern. Leaving New York in November for Liverpool with 509 souls aboard, she was coursing across the banks with fair weather 
but dark when near midnight, about 250 miles east of St. John's, she rammed the monster ice island at full speed, 18 knots. Terrific was the impact and indescribable the alarm. The passengers, flung from their berths, made for the deck as they stood, though some were so injured as to be helpless, and the calls of these forward added to the shrieks of the frenzied mob of half-clad men and women who charged for the boats, made up a pandemonium. Wild cries arose that the ship was sinking, for she had settled by the head, and with piteous appeals and despairing exclamations, the passengers urged the boats over that they might escape the death they thought inevitable. But the crew were will in hand, the officers maintained order, and a hurried examination being made, the forward bulkhead was seen to be safe. The welcome word was passed along that the ship, though sorely stricken, would still float until she could make a harbor. The vast white terror had lain across her course, stretching so far each way that when described, it was too late to alter the helm. Its giant shape filled the foreground, towering high above the mast, grim and gaunt and ghastly, immovable as the adamantium buttresses of a frowning seaboard. While the liner lurched and staggered like a wounded thing in agony, as her engine slowly drew her back from the rampart against which she had flung herself. She was headed for St. John's at a slow speed, so as not to strain the bulkhead too much, and arrived there 36 hours later. That little port, the crippled ship's hospital, has seen many a strange sight come in from the sea, but never a more astounding spectacle than that which she presented the Sunday forenoon she entered there. Be God, Captain, said the pilot, as he swung himself over the rail. I've heard of carrying coals to Newcastle, but this is the first time I've seen a steamer bringing a load of ice into St. John's. They are a grim race, these sailors, and the danger over. The captain's reply was, We were lucky, my man, that we didn't all go to the bottom in an ice box. Her deck and forepart were cumbered with great fragments of ice weighing over 200 tons in all, shattered from the berg when she struck, being so wedged into the fractures and gaps as to make it unwise to start them until she was docked. The whole population of St. John's lined the waterfront to witness her arrival. Her escape was truly marvelous, and the annals of marine adventure may be searched in vain for its equal. From top tail to keelson, her bows were driven in, the gaping wound fully twenty feet wide and the massive plates and ribs crumbled up like so many pieces of cardboard. All the ironwork was twisted into fantastic forms. The oak planking was smashed into splinters. The beams and stanchions which backed the bow were shattered and torn, and her stem piece had been wrenched off when she had bitten into the berg. As her dead weight, including engines and cargo, must have been fully ten thousand tons, and this propelled through the water at an 18-knot clip, must have produced an enormous momentum. The wonder is that she was not ripped apart and sent to the bottom with all on board in the twinkling of an eye. That she was well built, her experience attested. Had her forward bulkhead started and the water poured in, they must have abandoned her and taken to the boats, a most hazardous as well as unpleasant alternative. Everything fragile aboard her had been broken, and every human being had participated in a unique adventure, one which none wished repeated. She remained at St. John's some months, had a temporary wooden bow built into her, and then returned to New York for her permanent repairs. Many curious incidents occurred in the panic, as they always do on such occasions. A New York millionaire's wife rushed on deck barefooted and in her nightdress, drawing her stockings on her hands and vainly endeavoring to find the fingers. A man appeared from the saloon with two grip sacks and a life buoy. He tossed this overboard first, then threw the bags after it, and was following himself when seized by a sailor. An elderly gentleman with a weak heart fainted away in the saloon at the shock of the impact and was found there when the passengers returned from the deck to clothe themselves. Recovering to see the anxious-faced half-clad watchers about him, and believing for the moment that he was the cause of their concern, he deprecatingly observed, I am very sorry, do not be alarmed, 
It is nothing, I assure you. But to the one wounded ship that survives collision with a berg, a dozen perish. Presumably, when the shock comes, it loosens their bulkheads and they fill and founder. Or the crash may injure the boilers or engines which explode and tear out the sides, and the ship goes down like a plummet. As long ago as 1841, the steamer president with 120 people aboard, crossing from New York to Liverpool in March, vanished from human kin. In 1854, in the same month, the city of Glasgow left Liverpool for Philadelphia with 480 souls and was never heard of again. In February 1856, the Pacific from Liverpool for New York, carrying 185 persons, passed away down to a sunless sea. In May 1870, the city of Boston from that port for Liverpool, mustering 191 souls, met a similar fate. It has always been thought that these ships were sunk by collisions with icebergs or flows. As shipping traffic has expanded, the losses have been more frequent. In February 1892, the Neronic from Liverpool for New York. In the same month in 1896, the state of Georgia from Aberdeen for Boston. In February 1899, the Allegheny from New York for Dover. And once more in February 1902, the Huronian from Liverpool for St. John's all disappeared without leaving a trace. Between February and May, the Grand Banks are most infested with ice, and collision therewith is the most likely explanation of the loss of these steamers, all well manned and in splendid trim, and meeting only the storms which scores of other ships have braved without a scathe. This theory finds support in the fact that many crews have cheated death whose ships have gone under from contact with ice during the winter. A story whose amazing features outrival even the tale of the ancient mariner is that of the 19 persons from the Arctic ship Polaris. She was crushed off northern Greenland in October 1871, and the survivors were rescued from an ice flow on the Grand Banks the following April by the Newfoundland sealer Tigris. After having been adrift for 193 days, and traversing 1,600 miles of ocean on this island of ice. In March 1893, the sealer Diana rescued the crew of the steamer Castlegate from Dundee for New York, who were adrift on the flow, their ship having sunk by collision with a berg the previous night. In May 1897, the crew of the steamer Windsor Lake, which had also met disaster among the bergs, were taken off by the sealer Labrador, and in 1900 the steamer Iceland stove in her bow against a berg and narrowly escaped foundering. When the big cargo boat Concordia in July 1896 was plowing her way out of Belle Isle Strait for Liverpool, she hit a berg bow on and tore a gaping rent in her forepart big enough to drive a streetcar through. Only the hardest of work kept her afloat to reach St. John's. Equally marvelous was the escape the next June of the four-masted freighter Night Bachelor, which, on her way to New York, met a still more cruel wound and had her bowels stove to the bulkhead butts, so that she had to be hurried to land stern first to relieve the strain on her battered stem. In May 1899, the Hatatsu, timber laden from Quebec, entered a berg strewn area of the banks with a dense fog prevailing and only the loom of the bergs to guide her. Going dead slow, in wheeling to avoid one, she plumped into another and crumbled her bows up from forefoot to housepipe, the stem plates overlapping and giving a flat surface as if a giant wedge had been cut out of her forward. The John Bright rasped off part of her bottom on a growler in June, and the two were repairing in St. John's together. Most curious was the accident to the outsides in 1890. She was struck in the side by a berg while caught in a flow, and had her flank scored by a jagged gash that almost sent her to the bottom. In the dock at St. John's, they rolled sugar butts in and out through the gap. 
The most marvelous story of all is that of the steamer Portia, which embodies an incident as fanciful as ever Clark Russell conceived. She plied between New York and Newfoundland, her captain being Francis Ashe, an experienced navigator of St. John's, who had been ice pilot of Schley Squadron when it rescued the survivors of the Greeley Arctic Expedition in 1884. In June 1893, while off the Newfoundland coast with many tourists aboard, she sighted on a clear day a gleaming northern monarch, the magnificent proportions of which excited the admiration of the passengers who had never seen the light before. Captain Nash estimated its length at 800 feet and its height at 200, and with its fantastic pinnacles and crystal sides giving back a flood of rainbow tents, it is not surprising that the delighted onlookers begged the skipper to go near to that they might snapshot or sketch this ocean colossus at close range. Suddenly, as the ship slowly advanced, a gunshot from the berg, a shiver was felt. The ship grated heavily. A low rumbling sound was heard. The berg quivered and split asunder, and to the horror of all on board, it was realized that the ship was aground on part of the icy isle. As this mighty fragment found a new equilibrium in the ocean, its submerged base, being tossed upward, caught the Portia as in a cradle or dock and lifted her clear out of the water. For a moment or two, the situation of the ship and those aboard was critical beyond compare. She lay nearly upright in a shelving section of the berg and if this completed its somersault, she and her personnel must meet instant destruction. The horror of it blanched every cheek and stilled every tongue. Fortunately, the weight of the hull and cargo checked the upending motion and sent the mass settling back again. A huge wave created by the cleavage swept over the fragment holding the Portia and launched her back into her native element with bottom scarred and bruised but otherwise uninjured. Though the story seems incredible, yet it is undeniably true. As the Portia approached the berg, she ran on a submerged ledge of it. This disturbed the equilibrium of the main body, and the ice below the surface being honeycombed, or rotten, from the effect of the salt water and the summer sun, the shock caused it to turn over, and in doing so, it split apart, and she was caught on one portion. The escape seems still more miraculous when one realizes that had she not kept a fairly even keel, she must surely have sunk as she swept back into the sea. As it was, she had all she could do to battle with the mighty billows that threatened to engulf her, and she was headed away from this scene of peril with all hearts rejoicing that they had been mercifully spared after an experience that no others had ever been brought face to face with. The very next year, the Miranda, a sister ship of the Portia, was chartered to convey to Greenland a party of 60 scientists, professors and students from American universities. She sailed from St. John's in July in charge of Captain William Farrell, another skilled ice pilot, and two days later, off Belle Isle Strait, in a thick fog, punctured her bow against a berg. Fortunately, she was going dead slow and thus escaped serious injury, but she had to put back to effect repairs. These accomplished, she started again, but on the uncharted Greenland coast, she struck a reef, tore out her bottom, and sank in due course. The 92 persons comprising the party and crew got back on the Gloucester fishing vessel, Rigel, which was in Greenland water seeking halibut. In the summer of 1900, an American yacht, cruising on the Labrador coast, struck a berg in a fog, while slowly making her way along and on one of the party dropped dead of heart disease at the shock of the collision. The craft floated, but the passengers had quite enough of icebergs for that season, if not forever. Even the French and British warships that patrol the Newfoundland coast during the fishery season do not escape this danger crowded with men and carefully navigated though they are. In 1899, the British gunboat Buzzard stove in her bows against a growler off the French shore, and the next year, the French corvette Manche had a similar experience. 
In the early 80s, when the Americans sent a warship to this coast every summer on fishery service, the old Powhatan came near ending her days by testing her strength against a flow. The ice masses serve a novel purpose for the fleets all the summer through, being used as targets for big gun practice. When a specially formidable one drifts along past St. John's, a cruiser slips her moorings and runs to sea after it, pelting it with projectiles until she fires away her allowance. It is one of the sights of St. John's, the endless procession of icebergs of every shape and size that drifts by day after day, charming the eye and cooling the summer atmosphere. Sometimes they ground in the harbor mouth and prevent ships from entering or leaving. As you go north, they are in still greater number. Off Belle Isle Strait, they can be counted by hundreds, and since the New York liners choose the southern route, it is the Montreal boats which traverse the northern channel that are chiefly menaced by these ocean destroyers. The first ship the Allen Line ever lost, the Canadian, came to her ruin there in 1861 by running into a berg, and she carried down 35 humans with her, trapped like rats by the inrush of water when her forepart was burst open. The 266 survivors were brought to St. John's in a fishing vessel. Every few years since, there have been other ocean tragedies to record, the latest being that of the Gibraltar in 1896, which foundered so quickly that five men went to the bottom with her, the remainder of her people getting away in their boats and being picked up by the colonial cruiser Fiona, conveying Governor Sir Terence O'Brien and Commodore Curzon Howe of the British squadron around the French shore on an official trip. But the steamers are not the only ships that fare badly against birds. Sailors meet even worse disasters. In April 1897 occurred the most heart-rending tragedy in the records of the Grand Banks, one whose horrible story outrivals even fiction. The French brigantine Valiant from France for St. Pierre, Miquelon, with 74 men aboard to engage in cod fishing there, dashed herself against a berg at midnight, 120 miles off St. John's. The craft went to pieces like a bundle of boards, and those half-clad wretches who escaped being killed by the broken timbers when she struck, rushed on deck and threw over the boats. The wildest confusion prevailed, and the frightened crowd swarmed into the skiffs, overturning them and drowning themselves. About 25 perished this way, and 35 got away. 21 in the lifeboat, 7 in a jolly boat, and 7 in a dory, a flat-bottomed skiff used in fishing. They had no food, no water, no sails, and no oars. The men lacked adequate clothing, being coatless, and wearing wooden sabots without stockings. The sea ran high and drenched them, and the frost chilled their marrow. The flotilla separated before morning, and the jolly boat was never seen again. In the lifeboat was the captain's dog, and they killed and ate it the second day. That night, four men died of the cold and were thrown overboard, after being stripped of their clothes to cover the living. The third day, the boat got among the ice, and they allayed their thirst by sucking pieces broken off of the bergs. That night, seven more died, and being stripped, were consigned to the deep. After this, the narrative is a blank. On the seventh day, the schooner Victor sighted the boat, and bearing down on her, found four frost-bitten wretches alive, while the mutilated corpses which shared the skiff testified to the fact that the starving, freezing survivors had kept the vital spark alive by the last desperate resort of cannibalism. They were landed at St. Pierce, and two days later, the schooner Eugene brought in three survivors of the Dory's crew, who had prolonged existence only by the same dreadful alternative. All seven had such badly frosted feet that these extremities had to be amputated, and five patients succumbed to the knife only two surviving to tell the tale of this dreadful outcome of a marine disaster. Every few years, a horror results from the coming together of the wooden fabrics against the ice masses. To give them in detail would be impossible. The shock of the impact starts every plank in the hulls. They leak like a sieve, 
and having no compartments fill rapidly and go down almost before the panic-stricken crews can launch their boats. One incident may be cited because of its extraordinary features. In 1883, as the schooner Albatross was driving east across the banks in a murky storm, she met her in from a low-lying berg. Of her crew of ten, only two escaped, having cut clear the dinghy and launched it over the stern. Next day, they were picked up by the fishing schooner Energy, making for the Newfoundland coast. Driven south by bad weather, she sighted two days later the steamer Liddesdale with a load of cotton from the southern states for England. The steamer agreed to take the castaways, and in approaching to get to them, collided with the energy and sank her, though saving the crew. Thirty-six hours later, the Liddesdale herself went ashore near Cape Race and became a total loss. Thus, the two men from the Albatross were wrecked three times within a week by berg, steamboat, and rock, an experience probably unique. The fishing vessels on the banks cruising about in quest of cod often fall prey to these destroyers also, and weird are the circumstances attending some of the catastrophes. The portions of bergs above water are absolutely pure and fresh. The submerged parts become saturated with salt. The former are commonly attacked by the bank men for ice to preserve their bait and fish, or to melt for refilling their water casks. In 1899, the crew of the schooner Mervyn of St. John's were taking ice from a small berg when it turned over. One man was ashore on it, hewing out the blocks with his axe, and the next instant found himself elevated 20 feet in the air, with the boat upset and his comrades struggling in the water. They righted her again and stood by to aid him. His only chance of escape was to slide the sloping side of the berg. He could not spring clear of it into the water, owing to its formation. He let himself go and struck a projecting fragment in his descent. It tore the scalp off the back of his head and flung it over his eyes. Senseless and seemingly dying, he was taken to land and put in hospital. Then the ship returned to the banks and was never afterward heard of. Another fishing vessel sighted some wreckage on the base of a berg and sent a boat to examine it. She returned bringing a name board with the word Mervyn on it, so it is surmised that the vessel struck this berg and went down. How many other fishing smacks meet this fate and leave not even this melancholy evidence is beyond conjecture. When a small craft strikes one of these monsters, she is doomed. Once wounded, a few minutes will see her founder. Those on board have barely time to order their faculties ere they are battling for life in the vortex of their sinking ship or pinned below decks through the damage to the hatchways. Occasionally, some fortunate sailor escapes the general fate. Four years ago, as the Newfoundland coastal steamer was passing a lonely rock off the land, she descried a signal of distress flying. A boat was lowered and sent to the islet, returning with an unconscious man. He was one of the crew of the banker Emmeline, which had sunk from collision with a berg. His fifteen comrades perished, but he, grasping an oar, contrived to swim to this rock, the only foothold for miles around. He attached his shirt to the oar and set it up for a signal, and here he remained for four days and nights without food or drink, suffering tortures also from the cold. Nowadays, with the cellular system by which modern liners are subdivided, the likelihood of a catastrophe to an Atlantic Greyhound is very slight. She may telescope her stem or drive in her forefoot, but her bulkheads will keep her afloat. It is the old-time steamer or the one with insufficient compartments which goes down when she rams a berg in these northern waters and carries her whole crew to their death. Of the mysteries of lost ships which leave not a name board or scanty spread of wreckage to tell some part of their tale of tragedy, how many are due to berg or flow, no man may say, but the grimmest happenings about the Grand Banks are certainly chargeable to this cause. Earthly monarchs, however mighty, 
dare not disregard the peril of this route in their impotence against nature's giant lords. In the royal tour of the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall, now Prince and Princess of Wales, in 1901, the only place where the Ophir's escort of two cruisers had to be supplemented was off Newfoundland, and because of the icebergs there. The Crescent and the Indefatigable accompanied them from Halifax to St. John's, scouting cautiously for those silent ocean foes, and again in crossing the banks on the final run to Portsmouth. This precaution had to be renewed. The Diadem discovered one large berg at night and threw her searchlight on it while the squadron sped past in safety. It is only when a liner gets disabled and is swept among the flows that there is reason for anxiety. Such was the plight of the 1,200 humans in the French liner Gascon in March 1897 when crippled on the Grand Banks and at anchor there with the whole ocean covered with flows and bergs. She had broken her shaft and adverse gales drove her there. She anchored and apprised a passing schooner which brought the news to land. Meanwhile, the ice was drifting down and worked around about her. She was in danger of being nipped by the flows and the captain held on as long as he dared, hoping for help from St. John's or elsewhere, but eventually had to slip his cables and let her drift south into the Gulf Stream with the flows which enmeshed her. There the heat and sun soon relaxed their cohesive powers and she was freed to reach New York in due course. There was grave apprehension for her welfare for a time. Two steamers sent out from St. John's failed to locate her and it was feared the ice had sent her to the bottom. But she escaped this danger and got to port without mishap. People unfamiliar with icebergs or their lore may doubt that the sea monsters are as large or destructive as this narrative indicates, but no one who has traversed the northern seas or seen the crippled steamer making into port with gaping bows, telling of her combat, will question for a moment the most improbable story of battle with these rovers. The really amazing feature of the bergs is that they show so little of their bulk, one-eighth above water. Hence, even when a colossal one is seen, the mind fails to grasp the significance of what it represents, the vast bulk concealed below the ocean level. It is only when a berg overturns that an idea of its immensity is obtained. This occurrence usually results through one berg fouling with another, the nicely adjusted balance being disturbed and throwing off fragments with noises like the discharge of a park of artillery the movement communicating itself in turn to the bergs in the vicinity until they are turning turtle like a school of whales at play. Such a scene is not uncommon along the Labrador coast in summer, where hundreds of bergs are to be sighted every day, and the mail boat gives them a wide berth as she makes her risky runs up and down the rugged seaboard. An American college professor two years ago counted 176 in one day from a hilltop at Cape Charles. These figures cease to excite surprise when it is remembered that the bergs are the products of the Greenland glaciers and are formed by the thousand in the far northern fjords. As the glaciers sweep into the sea, they calve or throw off mighty blocks, and these are what we know as icebergs. Some are of stupendous dimensions. Dr. Kane's Arctic expedition saw one two and a half miles long and two and a half miles wide, a ground in a half a mile of water in Melville Bay. This of course broke up into small pieces in time, which sun and sea and tide molded into the beautiful and fantastic forms familiar to the Arctic voyager. As they drift south and the sun plays on their facade, it melts them into the sea, while below the tide frets them into delicate traceries. Then the berg gets top-heavy, turns over, and exhibits an absolutely new contour, and so the process continues until they disappear in the Gulf Stream. The Labrador current which carries them on its bosom extends from the Polar Sea to the south of Newfoundland, an oceanic river 2,000 miles long and 100 wide 
and generously bejeweled with these gorgeous creations. And as an irreverent tourist remarked last summer, they represent enough cold storage to put the ice trust out of business and give every American citizen and refrigerator stock of his own. The fishermen of Newfoundland possess the curious faculty of being able, as they say, to smell bergs, and thereby escape many encounters with them. Really, however, the fact is that the approach of a berg is heralded by a sudden and decided cooling of the atmosphere, which these experienced mariners soon perceive and are warned by. But oftentimes a vessel will run into a nest of them and may have to be towed to safety by her boats. A frequent cause of disaster is that the submerged section of a berg being caught in the grip of a current, the mass moves steadily against wind and sea and crashes into the craft before she can escape. The same circumstances cause the remarkable sight sometimes witnessed of flows driven one way by the wind while bergs cut a wide swath through them in another direction impelled by the currents. The lee of a berg is often a favorite shelter from storm, and Arctic steamer, northern whalers, and Newfoundland sealers frequently adopt the novel expedient of anchoring to bergs, which experience shows them to be surely balanced, and by this means they avoid disaster in gales which, if they lack such security, would cripple if not destroy them. No discovery or invention relating to maritime matters would be of as great benefit to the shipping world as the contrivance which would give timely warning of the proximity of icebergs. Bells, whistles, lights, rockets, and other devices have been provided for, protecting ships against colliding with one another, and now we are assured that wireless telegraphy will soon be enlisted for the same object. This, if it succeeds, should make running through fog as devoid of danger as speeding across a cloudless sea, except for the bergs. But until this peril has been eliminated, the passage of the North Atlantic will be attended by an element of danger which must compel the greatest precaution on the part of seafarers and occasionally bring about a disaster like some of the foregoing, in spite of the utmost vigilance of shipmasters and men. This article appeared in McClure's Magazine, June 1904. This is a Country Road production because history is fascinating.